Believe it or not, uh, midterm elections were, what, just five months ago. Now we're in the race for presidency all over again. I Googled when the first primary debate is. You know when it is? In two months, June. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. Now, I don't need to remind you, but I will, that uh, we're living in a day of extreme polarization I don't think like I've ever seen. You know, the 60s and the Vietnam War, I don't think still compare to this. This is much more. You know, I can say something's down and you say it's up. You can say it's right. I say it's wrong. I listened to one young congresswoman speaking about the abortion issue, and she used the word moral and immoral. And those would have been the opposites, how I would have used them. What she called moral, I would have said, well, that's immoral. Polarizing, right? Uh, and you know, this divide is only going to continue until either one of two things. When the, if there was a surge with the gospel and people are born again, that's going to change. Or it's when Jesus Christ does come again. You know, we look at our nation and most all of Americans have strong opinions coming down one side or the other. And I don't see a lot of teamwork going on in our national nor moral issues as a country. We have a divided nation. Well, such was the case when Jesus Christ walked on this earth. Rome occupied Israel. Israel still had its own functioning, but there was division within there, and it was Jesus Christ who was a cause of that. This historical Jesus What do we believe about him today? What was believed about him then? Take your Bibles. Please turn to John chapter 10. And in this series that we're adding as we approach Easter, the greatest day of celebration for the believer, we look at Jesus as the giver of life. But for that to be true, if that's going to be true, we have to be a person who surrendered our life to Jesus. And there lies the rub, that inner conflict that causes this great divide. Because, you see, we have to believe that Jesus is God. And believing that he's the only way to God the Father. It's not through Islam. It's not through Hinduism. It's not. And if you hold to that, you're on a very narrow path. In contrast to a society that says, ah, you can believe what you want. All all paths lead to God if you believe there is a God. In contrast, Jesus was very clear, right? He had divisive claims that he is the only way to God the Father. As we saw by way of introduction last Sunday, setting up this great miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Back in chapter 10, right, Jesus explained that he's the giver of eternal life. And then he claimed to be one with the Father. That did not go over very well. The Jewish hostile leadership, right, tries to stone Jesus, and we see in John's text why, for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. But Jesus escapes, it's not his hour. Jesus, uh, the giver of life, he is the cause, and those who follow him will experience this great divide. Some weeks or months after that encounter that we just looked at, Jesus returns to the hostile environment just outside the capital of Jerusalem. He goes to Bethany. And there Jesus, remember in his conversation with Martha, he again claims to be the giver of life, eternal life. And then he demonstrates that fact as he raised Lazarus back to life. That's something only God can do. We know that. The Jews knew that. This morning we're going to look and think through four different reactions to Jesus, seeing this widening polarization that will lead to the last week of his life. And for us, it will lead us to his table. If you got your outline, if that's a help to you, uh, point one, I want us to see the first reaction, those reacting to Jesus with a responsive heart, right? We saw a little bit about that last week. Point A, this begins with an initial observation. It's pretty hard to react to Jesus if you have no, have no knowledge or understanding or reading of who he is. Verse 45, right? John records for us that there were some Jews there, friends, acquaintances, 
associates who came to Mary and Martha to mourn with them over the death of their brother. And then they just witnessed this unspeakable miracle. They saw Jesus calling Lazarus out of that tomb and that dead man shuffling out with his grave clothes on. They observed Jesus directly. Today, no one can observe Jesus directly. Their observations have to come through the reading of the word, the working of the Holy Spirit through his word, or Jesus has to be seen in you and me. We've got to be the difference maker, right? Christ in you, living out, shining his light. Point B, some respond with belief. We see that in verse 45, right? They saw, they believed in him. If you go back a few verses, look at verse 41, right? And Jesus there prayed out loud before he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And he prayed for those who would believe in him, that they would believe in him, believing that he is the sent one. That's a, that's a key concept, sent from God with purpose, now, again, John gives us just this short little prayer. I doubt if that's all Jesus prayed. We don't know all that he prayed, but we see the response of people. Jesus, right, speaks as he prays. Remember going back, and one of the phrases he uses is what Martha used. Back when Jesus asked Martha, Martha back in verse 27, what, do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe? And she said, yes, and it was full of meaning. I believe you're Messiah, this promised one of God who has come. I believe that you are son of God. In the Jewish mind, that means to be God. And then Jesus prays the very phrase that Martha used, right? That you are the one come from into the world. On mission, with purpose. There's no reason not to believe that the Lord's prayer was answered, right? As, as some of those there placed their faith in Jesus. Point C, you know, responsive heart can be responding with excitement, right? Now, I need you to jump ahead a little bit, but it's not belief. It's just excitement. People get excited with Jesus. Jump down to verse 54. And at this point, Jesus has left Jerusalem again. Verse 55, our account, is the week before Passover. And many people are coming to the capital for the celebration of Passover. They have their Passover lamb slaughtered. And for that to happen, they have to pass through a tank through, through us of water in order for their ceremonial cleansing. So this, is, this can be happening. A lot of people are coming. So this could be prior to that week. And what's the buzz around town? You see it. Read, you, you look at it. Verse 56. They're looking for Jesus. Hey, you know, you, you, did you hear what he did in Bethany? Can you believe it? Call Lazarus out of the tomb. I can't believe it. You think he's got to come to Passover, doesn't he? They're all excited to see Jesus. Look at chapter 12, verse 9. And Jesus at this banquet, words out. Jesus is over in Bethany, the great miracle worker, Jesus. This life giver, how he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And, and now they hear Jesus is there, and they want to head there to Bethany, not just to see Jesus, but to see who? Lazarus! Can you believe it? And they're excited because of what Jesus could do. But this isn't genuine belief, not from this crowd. For sure, people have their own concept of Jesus. I wonder how many of you, if you came to know Jesus as an adult, how many of you, how would you describe your view of Jesus prior to that? I'm sure you had your own concept and people like their own concept of Jesus, especially if he's not this concept, right? You had your own view of who Jesus was, you know, kind and nice. Jesus wouldn't condemn anyone. Jesus accepts everybody. I, I hear those phrases. Those people don't know Jesus. In that century, with Jesus there, they, they were thinking he's the miracle worker. You know, he, he caused that man that was born blind to see. He, he cast those demons out of, out of a man. He, he healed that deaf man. Do you remember that? And so they're caught up with lots of excitement in Jesus. In a few more days, Jesus is going to be riding into Jerusalem on that donkey, looking like, playing the role of Messiah, and they're going to go along and play with it. They don't believe he is. But there's excitement, but there's not genuine faith. Some application. Lots of people react and respond to Jesus. But the only response that matters is trusting him as the sent one, come with purpose to be the one crucified to pay the price for our sin. 
Lots of people worship Jesus. They worship them with their own concept. They, they, they worship him the way they want to worship him. They don't go to the scriptures to understand who he is, what he's done, and why he's done it. You and I know that it all starts with that heart turning to Jesus and saying, I, I have to turn from my sin to embrace you as my rescuer to live a life set apart unto you. That's a whole different concept than Jesus is a nice, good man. Well, point two, we see a reaction. React, people reacting to Jesus with an opposing heart. Let's look at that viewpoint. Verses 46 and 47, right? Point A, these people know, they know what Jesus is doing and they know his teaching. Point one, this is from people in general, the general public. Verse 46, those who went to see Mary and, Joseph, or, um, Mary and Martha in at, at, at their time of grief and after hearing the Lord's prayer out loud for them and witnessing his power, they're not neutral with Jesus. They react. They go to the religious leaders. You see that in the text? They probably feared the religious leaders more than they feared the power of Jesus. You know, here they are mourning with their friends and this Jesus shows up. And they probably here remember the, what the warning was that the religious leaders gave about this Jesus. It goes back to when Jesus healed this man born blind. Let's go back to John 9, 22. And we read this. The Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was Messiah, the, the, the leaders knew what Jesus is doing. Right? Anyone who believes that is going to be put out of the synagogue. And I'll tell you, their synagogues, their local synagogues, was their, their, their way of living. It was the center of their life. So these mourners are more afraid of that edict from the religious leaders than they are of who Jesus, the impact of who Jesus is. There's people like that. They're afraid of what others will say, and then they toy with Jesus, but they can't be in him because there's too many other pressures around them. So these people. We know at point two, as well as religious leaders, they know what Jesus taught. Those religious leaders know exactly what Jesus was saying, what he could do. Just as true today. Point B, those with opposing hearts, they make plans to defeat Jesus. There are plenty of organizations in our country today who want to stamp out Christianity. In the Lord's Day, verse 47, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they want to stamp out Christ as well. And they call for a meeting of the chief priests, the, the, uh, which means the, the consisted of former high priests and their family members, important priestly families. Most of them were Sadducees. They had a doctrinal difference with the Pharisees. They're from the upper level of society. The Sadducees were more compromising with Rome. Um, the Pharisees, on the other hand, are more middle class. They were adherers, strict adherers to the law and, and, and the scriptures and especially the oral law. Normally these two groups don't come together, but they do with a common enemy and they do against Jesus. The Sanhedrin is a ruling council. It's made up of 70 men. And they were allowed by Rome to oversee civil and criminal issues, but mostly all, for sure, all the religious issues. And now they're in a panic. They questioned themselves. Look at the middle of verse 47. Here's this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe in him. Well, that's an exaggeration. And then Rome will come and take away both our temple and our nation. And so they have a fear that Jesus has been very popular with the people. And how is Rome going to react to this? And they're going to come and stamp us out. They hated Jesus because Jesus was a threat to who they were, their power, their position, their temple. And of course, Rome in 70 AD does stamp out the temple and crush Israel. So they leaders craft a plan, verse 49. Caiaphas, who was a high priest at that time, John writes that year, meaning the year when Jesus was put to death. Caiaphas was high priest from 18 A.D. to 36 A.D. To the council, he was speaking rudely, very self-centered. Verse 49 and 50, he says, you know nothing at all. And what he said was under the facade of patriotism. 
This was his way, really, of getting rid of this pain in his neck, Jesus. Jesus was capturing the hearts of people. They don't want to lose their position. He argues. Substitutionary salvation, right? That's his view. He says it this way. If Jesus lives, the nation dies. If Jesus dies, the nation lives. Hmm. Verse 53. They set their goal to plot and resolve that Jesus is going to be killed. They're going to take his life. Look down at chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. We see the ugliness of their heart. This shows us the power of the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Because now they not only want to put Jesus to death, but they also want to murder Lazarus. Because of Lazarus, many people are believing in Jesus. Clearly, point C. I want us to see that those in opposition, they're not sovereign. Only God is in sovereign. Only God is in control. That's true today. It was true then. Point, a, point one, God is sovereign over opposition. Let's not, let's not think there's dualism going on here. You know, good and evil, who's going to win? I don't know. God is solely sovereign. Only he, God, is. Jesus is the son of God. Verse 51, John now interject, interjects how God was working through Caiaphas, this Wretched, evil man that he was. You know, the high priest was to have a special relationship with, with the Lord, but he sure doesn't, and many other high priests sure didn't either. His heart was evil, and yet God speaks truth through him. Isn't that right? That happens all the time. God uses the righteous and the what? Unrighteous to carry out his purpose. Verse 51, Caiaphas did not say this on his own, right? That's what John's writing. But his high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. John explains the depth of that statement, that it goes beyond Caiaphas. Jesus indeed would be a substitutionary death on the cross. That's what we celebrate right here. Jesus died for the Jewish nation, but more than that, look at verse 52. He died for all of God's children, right? Scattered through the world, those who aren't Jews as well, those who come to faith in him. Secondly, God is sovereign over his own. We know that. Jesus, the Son of God, right? He knows what's going on. He is God. He is sovereign. Jesus knows about the opposition. He also knows that it's not yet his time to be taken, right? So he and his disciples keep a low profile. That's verse 54. They go north in Israel near the town of Ephraim, or the town of probably in early February. It's not sure where this town is, or that's where they believe it would be, 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem, very small, out-of-the-way wilderness town. In chapter 12, in the sovereignty of God, Jesus is now heading to Jerusalem again for the final time. It's now April. This is a week away from his death, burial, and resurrection. And what happens? There's this great celebration. Jesus is in town. He comes to Bethany, right? His good friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, are celebrating that a significant event will take place. God is sovereign over all details. He's working out his plan of full redemption. It's true then, it's just as true today. And we're waiting for that day when God says now and those events start. Some application. God, we know God is in control. You, we, he's in control of all that is happening. He, he's in control of what's flowing in the United States and, and Europe and the European nations. Is, is, is Britain going to drop out of the... Of the who, who, I don't know. God is sovereign. Uh, it, it, you know, is Europe going to start buying their, their natural gas from Russia and pipeline it in? And what does that do? And what does that do to our alliances? And, and what about China and all those things that are going on? Do we not know God is sovereign over all of that stuff? He is. And we don't have to live in quake. We do. The disciples sure did. Just wait a few more days. But we don't have to live that way. God is sovereign over all the details. We can trust him. Don't quake in fear. But you know what we have to do? What we must do? We need to pray. We need to say, God, as you orchestrate these details, I'm for you. I'm for you. I will stand for you. I want my life to count for you. I'm going to verbalize my faith. I am going to speak about the moral differences between me and Scripture and the society. I'm not going to do it in a harsh way, a mean way. But I want to stand for God's word. 
with grace, with mercy. That needs to be us. Point three. We see those reacting to Jesus with a self-centered heart, self-seeking heart. Point A, they follow Jesus as long as it benefits themselves, right? And, and Jesus is now relaxing with Lazarus and, and, and Martha and Mary and, and the disciples. And there's other guests there at this banquet for Jesus and honored him. Matthew, Mark, and John's gospel. Uh, you put those details together. John's showing the sequence. It's believed by commentaries and commentators. Matthew and Mark give us a thematic piece here in their gospel. None of them give details that contra are contrary to each other. They're simply more information. Luke's gospel does not report this. He reports something that similarly happened to Jesus earlier in his ministry. This celebration is at the home of Simon the leper. Well, he's been healed. He's no longer with leprosy. The dinner is given in the honor of Jesus. In a few minutes, we're going to look at the Mary account. I want to end on that one because that's the positive one. But we're going to look at Judas, right? His heart, verses 4 to 6. Mary's just poured out this costly perfume on the feet of Jesus, and we see how Judas reacts. Verse 4, look at it. He objects. Verse 5, here's his reasoning. Why well, wasn't the perfume sold and the money given to, to the poor? It's worth years' wages. What's the cause of that reaction? Was Mary's devotion just over the top? Come on, Mary, get a hold of yourself. You, you know, people can react that way to you, right? What are you, a Jesus freak? What are you, what are you a Jesus we're a fanatic? And, and, and people react all the time. But that's not Judas' heart here. He's not objecting to her radicalism. He's reacting to, I wanted some of that, you know? Sold, them, sold it, given to my purse, because John reports what he's like, right? Well, look at that. John tells us. You know, well, what was Judas looking for? Was he, in, was he, he gives three years of his life to follow Jesus. Obviously, his heart's not in Jesus. He's one of that 12. And he's got something in his mind other than God's, Christ's agenda, but his own agenda. But he's following along until the time comes when he might realize that what Jesus is really going to pull off doesn't benefit me. And he cuts a deal for 30 pieces of silver and sells Jesus over. Some application. Do you, do you know anyone like Judas? They got their own agenda for Jesus. They're out there, right? But they want their benefits. You know, there, there's people I know. They they go to certain churches because it's it's a popular thing to do, or because they want to feel good. And this church makes me feel good, and and, and I don't want to get radicalized, radicalized about Jesus. And 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 we know people who follow Jesus because in their mindset. They, they see him as a good person, a good man, and they want to emulate goodness. I had, had a friend in high school who wanted to go in the ministry. He didn't know Jesus as a savior, but he knew Jesus was a good man, and he wanted to go in and, and to help others be good like Jesus is good. That was his whole purpose. Jesus calls us to commitment. It's not about, it's not about how can I fit Jesus into my mold, right? How can I make him benefit me? There has to be a repentance of sin, a turning of one's life over to Jesus. It can't be Jesus, I put Jesus into my mix of life. My life needs to be in Jesus. That's not Judas. Fourthly, we see those reacting to Jesus with a devoted heart. And this wonderful, wonderful picture of someone who sold out to Jesus. This is Mary. We see three qualities. I see three qualities in her, and they need to be seen in us. Point A, you know, this, this one is selfless. Mary takes this bottle of pure nard or oil perfume. This is an herb uh, grown in the high pasture land of the Himalayas between Tibet and India. And it was hard to obtain. It was very expensive. Judah says it's worth a year's wages of a, of a laborer. The volume is enormous for that cost. Mary's family, were they well off? We don't know. Was this an heirloom that Mary had? We don't know. But she has it. It's her possession. There's a jar, a pint of pure nard. And Mary is selfless. She takes it, breaks the bottle, neck of the bottle. John reports it. She pours it over the feet of Jesus. A year's wage dumped out, down 
the dream. Are you kidding me? Matthew and Mark tell us that she poured it out over the head of Jesus. You know, when they're reclining and eating, they're sitting at a low table, they're leaning in, their feet are out. Probably Mary dumps it on his head and down his clothes and down to his feet. Why? Because of her love, her devotion to Jesus, a heart that overflows with gratitude to Jesus. She reacts to Jesus selflessly. Secondly, point B, we see that this one is humble. She's on her knees before the Lord and wipes his feet with her hair. No decent woman in that day lets her hair down in public. It's always up back. And she does it. She doesn't care. This is her moment. The house is filled with this fragrance. Regardless of the cost financially, regardless of what this would say about her reputation, she doesn't care. She's devoted and she's humble. Point C, this one serves the living Christ. Look at verse 7 and 8. Look what Jesus says about her, right? To Judas, right? Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for my, for my, my burial, the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. It's not perfectly understood exactly what Jesus meant. The phrase, save the purpose for my burial, maybe Mary was just saving it because she knows Jesus is in danger. The, the disciples knew, right, that Jesus' life was in danger by those in Jerusalem. And so Mary, living right there in the thick of it, maybe she understood that as well. Maybe, maybe she pours it out because, because she wasn't sure she could do it in his burial. Maybe she didn't know how he was going to die through this mess. But whatever, she pours it out to Jesus. Verse 8. Jesus explains that he's not always going to be here. You'll always have the poor. You're not always going to have me. This devoted woman serves Jesus while there's an opportunity. And that needs to be me and that needs to be you. You know, I, the question from application is, you know, how do, we, how do we show our devotion to Jesus? And you got to think about, how do I show? That's just a haunting question in my mind. How do I show my devotion? Life is busy. Life is crazy. You th think through a typical day of your life. How do we show that devotion in a typical day? I don't think it's easy to get our, hand, our, our minds around that. Mary in humility, serving, being selfless. You know, it's what Jesus did, right? In a few more days, it's going to be the upper room, and, and Jesus is going to have Passover with his disciples. You remember what that happened there. Jesus demonstrates by service. He, you know, there's no servant to wash anyone's feet, and, and surely I'm not going to wash Matthew's feet because we're peers, so that's not going to happen. What does Jesus do? He gets down and washes their feet. Doing what is selfless. You know, the next question is, you know, how do we value Jesus? That's a different peace, then how do we value him? How do we demonstrate that value? What are we doing in our daily lives? Do we sacrifice our time, our resources, our, our pride? Do we, uh, CIA Day is one great way to, to serve Jesus, to show our value to Jesus. We value him. We're going to do something for him in honor for him, and so we serve. CIA Day would be a great way to illustrate that. Okay, you got to pull out that VBS flyer. This side, not this side. This side. And, and you know, talking with children's ministries, and I felt pretty burdened about this. I think VBS is one of our greatest outreaches. It's a highlight for me. I love serving in VBS. But we've got a whole bunch of, and you can add them up because I didn't, uh, what our total need is for leadership positions. And a year ago by now, we had all those filled so we can go work on the other 50 adults and or 70 adults and 50 teens that we need. But first, we've got to fill leadership positions, and we don't have them filled. There's still a bunch of the holes, as you can see. And my thought is, if we can't get those filled, we can't have VBS this summer. Maybe we have to switch to the night VBS, I don't know, in another year. But we probably, if we can't get these filled, because it's already April. If we don't get those filled by the end of the month, I don't know. We were, that's the debate that we're having right now. I don't think we can have VBS. I don't want that to happen. So, you know, am I laying on a little guilt? 
probably. Um, how do I value? How do I show devotion? I thought that might fit. Um, you know, I, there's valid excuses. You know, I'm going to be out of town. You know, Pastor Dan and those going on the missions trip, they're out of town that week. Uh, they get back, I think, Monday night or so. So, you know, how do we do that? How do we fill it? You know, I got grandkids. I got my kids. I see vacation Bible school is my break time for my kids. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. What do we say? I have a full-time job. Well, that cuts into it for sure. I, I don't know. I'm just laying that out. You can pray over that. Maybe some of you say, I can help. Some of you might say, I'm not sure I can do that. I don't know what's involved. Well, call someone at CM. They'll fill you in. All right? We got a need to me. I close. I'm going to wrap this up and come to the Lord's table. And in conclusion, I, I have some questions there, a lot of questions. I'm just going to have you look at them briefly. You know, we, we looked at reactions to Jesus, and I'm not concerned with the world's reaction to Jesus. I'm concerned about our reaction to Jesus. You know, the, do we have a responsive heart? That's the first question. Do we have a heart that's open to Jesus? That was the whole point of salvation. Maybe there's some here, two or three, I don't know, four of us, who haven't yet given our heart to Jesus. Have you seen enough in Jesus to say, I understand who you are, the Savior, the Redeemer? I, I know enough. Yes, I surrender my life to Jesus. That's a responsive heart. Is that you this morning? Second question, you know, I, I doubt if any of us have opposition hearts today. If you, you probably wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be here, but maybe you do. But, but for sure, all of us know someone who have an opposing heart to Jesus. Do you not? Some who are just against Jesus. And we need to pray and think, well, what can I do specifically to demonstrate Christ's love to them? Wouldn't that be something we need to be praying about? Third question, my biggest concern, these last two reactions, having a self, you know, some of us may have a self-seeking heart. You know, what's in it for me? And, and Jesus, what do you do for me? And we want Jesus to fit into our schedule and our agenda. That's pretty self-seeking. The fourth one, for sure, we all need to have devoted hearts just like Mary. And, and, and there's a cost to that. You know, I think of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You know, what does it cost us? It costs, us, costs who I am. It costs me. It costs all that I have. No selfishness, no self-seeking, no withholding. Now, that doesn't mean we can't just relax a little bit and enjoy life. Jesus withdrew. Jesus enjoyed. I'm sure he laughed plenty with his disciples. I, I'm not talking about that. It's okay to cry when your team loses. Right, Pastor Corey? Yeah. It's okay to do that. I'm glad you came today. You know, we probably find ourselves too busy. We're all too busy. I, you know, we could say, who's not too busy? And then we're going to take some pictures and grab you quick. But we're too busy. Life is busy. Our kids and our family and, 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 and jobs and jobs and, and, and sports and family and our kids' agendas and our kids' sports. It's crazy. I'm talking about more of an attitude of, of being devoted to the Lord, an attitude, how we live our life for him. Having that quiet time that we don't negotiate away from. You know, you could say, well, where does Jesus fit in? That's just the, that's a crazy question. Where does Jesus fit into my life? What? <laughs> try and fit Jesus. I'm going to try and fit Jesus in this week. We can accomplish this, having a devoted life at work, when it's about our attitude. It means being kind and compassionate and forgiving and loving and serving others. I guess my question is, are we doing what's most important? What's most important? It's our walk with the Lord. It's to love Jesus first in our lives. It's to deepen our relationship with him. And I don't want you to make that overcomplicated. I just want each of us, and me too, to say, what's one step I can take to grow my relationship with Christ? What's one step I can take to be devoted to him? You know, if I said, so what bottle do you possess that you could break and pour out on Jesus? What's that one bottle? Let's bow for prayer. Heads bowed. As you do, the ushers are going to ask you, to, or our men who are serving the Lord's Supper, would you please come to the front? And your head's bowed this morning, and you, you're here this morning, and 
maybe you're ready to step into that response, that right response to, to embrace Jesus as your Savior. You can do that. Right this moment, silently, you're, from your own heart, you can say, Jesus, I understand enough. You are the Savior, the Redeemer. You died on that cross to pay for my sin. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you. If that's your prayer, let me know that this morning. I want love to talk with you. Pastor Corey's here.